Okay, so why don't we, why don't we start? <clears throat> Hi, hello everybody. Welcome to our first IPA Journal Club with Jonathan Shedler, PhD. Uh, my, my name is Jack Drescher and I am a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst in New York City. Um, I'd like to introduce Jonathan, who is, uh, who is known as the author of what may be the most widely read psychoanalytic paper of our time, which we're not discussing today, which is, but that paper was called The Efficacy of Psychodynamic Psychotherapy, uh, which has firmly established psychoanalytic psychotherapy as an evidence-based treatment. Uh, Dr. Shedler has asked me to keep it short, but he has written more than 100 scientific and scholarly articles in psychology, psychiatry, and psychoanalysis and actually has a blog that reaches audiences in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, I had the pleasure of having dinner with him uh, in San Francisco a couple of weeks ago. Um, so uh, good to see you, Jonathan. Um, the paper we're discussing today, which... which could, 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 thank you. Please keep yourself muted. So the paper uh, we're discussing today was published in, in a journal called Contemporary Psychoanalysis in 2022. It's called That Was Then, This Is Now, Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy for the Rest of Us. And if you don't uh, have the paper, uh, Santina is going to put in the chat the uh, link to download the paper if you haven't downloaded it yet. Um, but before we begin, a few comments about the format for today. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I, Santina, you actually have the ability to mute anybody who, who, does, who hasn't muted themselves, so maybe you could do that. So I just want to give a few comments about the format for today. Uh, so, who is that? Unfortunately, I cannot find the person as I'm speaking. Okay. It's the one with Chinese symbols, if you can find it. Really? Yep. I see it on my screen. Then you can yeah. unmute them. It's muted as now. Okay. okay, great. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Thank you. That's okay. So, uh, so my first comment, prepared comment was, was to ask you to bear with us in the event of technical glitches, because this is the first time we're doing the journal club. So that was our first glitch. Uh, I'd like also, the goal of this journal club is to be interactive so that the readers of the paper can speak directly with an author. There will be future journal clubs next academic year. Uh, this session is being recorded and will be available for viewing. At at, at the IPA website at some future date. And I'm gonna to start today with a question of my own for, for, for Jonathan. Wait, uh, hold on, let's... let's. Um... <clears throat> You're going to have to keep unmuting it. It, 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 it It's un... When I got she... it. I, I, I just muted everyone. So, so people will be able to unmute themselves or Santina, you'll be able to unmute people to, you know, to ask questions or participate. But right now Perfect. everybody's muted. It, it was okay. in the participants window. Yeah, okay. And, I, and I'm helping admit some more people now. So we, okay. So uh, my first question to Jonathan is, um, uh, oh, I also have to say before I go there, uh, uh, today, if you have your question, put it in the Q&A section. The Q&A sec uh, icon is in the bar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We're not using the chat function for this meeting. And I will select questions I think that uh, people might want to hear. We may not get to all the questions today because we only have an hour or so. Um, uh, you are being muted unless you're called upon to pose a question. If you're called on, please unmute yourself and turn on your video camera if it's not already turned on. And when you're called upon, please identify yourself and let us know where you are speaking from. Um, so the first question for Jonathan uh, is, is uh, what do you think was your motivation to take up at least two issues in your writing and public speaking? One, that of debunking myths about psychoanalysis and that of making psych, and the second part is making psychoanalytic jargon more accessible. Good question. 
so it's a, uh, there are actually multiple answers. Uh, one is that I, I was and continue to be just, you know, blown away by the, just the extent of rampant misunderstanding of psychoanalytic and psychodynamic thinking and therapy. Um, people get exposed to myths, pejorative disinformation, some of it quite willful. Um, it, it's actually impossible to find, you know, if people take a, uh, you know, an introductory psychology class in university, it's actually impossible to find a textbook that provides even a remotely accurate description of what psychoanalysis or, or psychodynamic treatment is about. I, I mean, just, just misunderstanding is rampant. It's actively perpetuated. Um, what, people, what people tend to encounter are stereotypes and caricatures of psychoanalysis as it existed literally in the horse and buggy era. Um, and and what's presented in textbooks and, and and journal articles and you know online information sources. I mean, it, it's it's not even the horse and buggy or a psychoanalysis. It's it's <laughs> you know it's bizarrely wrong misrepresentations of the horse and buggy era, often presented as if it's synonymous with with psychoanalysis today. Um, and. You know, it really, uh, it, it, it's really troubling. I mean, psychoanalysis has become the whipping boy of choice for every other, every other therapy orientation. So most of what people learn about psychoanalysis and psychodynamic treatment is actually presented by people who are overtly, openly antagonistic to it, you know, using it as a foil. And, and they actually treat it as a, like a kind of a Rorschach test, right? I mean, they might, might as well substitute where they say psychoanalysis, you might as well substitute the boogeyman, because they just attribute all kinds of, you know, absurd nonsense to it. And, you know, this is what the public gets exposed to. The consequence of this is you know, we've had generations of really, really smart, you know, thoughtful people, you know, accrued clinical wisdom and experience and knowledge accrued over a century that's simply being lost, lost to the profession, lost to the culture, um, with, I think, profoundly bad consequences for what's happening in treatment. You know, we've got clinicians who really you know, misunderstand psychodynamic concepts themselves, but are really missing some very basic concepts. So I, I, you know, there's a direct to me, there are direct implications for patient care. That's half of the answer. Um, the other half of the answer is it's easy speaking from within the psychoanalytic community and point the finger and say, well, this is managed care companies, it's politicians, you know, public policy makers, it's, um, you know, it's proponents of other therapies, but we have to take responsibility too, it's us, because people who come to psychoanalysis who might, who, who in fact are very interested in our concepts and ideas, and whether they know it's psycho psychoanalytic or not, you know, as a way of thinking about people, they come and they find a barrier of absolutely impenetrable, incomprehensible jargon, right? And we need to do better. You know, people are already getting disinformation about us. And then if they encounter actual, you know, psychoanalytic writings, um, they encounter something that turns them off unnecessarily. Let me just uh, add on to that question a little bit, which is how do you understand what's going on within psychoanalysis itself that this is, you know, the case? You know, what are we doing as psychoanalysts that are that is perpetuating the stigma that we ourselves are experiencing? I think that has a lot of answers also, but I, I mean, I'll address just one. You know, I think for historical reasons, Again, going back to the the turn of the century, the turn of the twentieth century, and you know, and and Freud, um, the culture of psychoanalysis has been inward facing, you know, insular, and largely oblivious to what's going on outside of our own echo chambers, um, and 
I think psychoanalysis, psychoanalysts in particular, have been absolutely terrible at understanding the difference between internal communications meant for other people in our community, ways of talking to other psychoana psychoanalysts, and you know, talking to the general public. We, we often don't make that distinction. And you know, what we end up doing, I think, is talking in a way that's intended to signal to other people in the psychoanalytic community, you know, signal our insider status, not communicate you know, to the world outside. And I think the consequences for psychoanalysis have been you know, catastrophic. I mean, I, I'm repeating myself, but it bears repeating. I mean, absolutely you know, like crucial, necessary knowledge about mind, behavior, and how to work effectively with people in treatment you know, is, go, is being lost and, and, and it could be lost forever. Thank you. You know, there's a real understanding. Insight, you know, insight per se doesn't cure people. There, there's, a, there's a big difference between, you know, intellectual, or, you know, cognitive insight, you know, versus what we could call perhaps emotional insight, where something really, you know, sinks in at a deep emotional level where somebody feels it in their bones, where it's connected to their emotional life, you know, in a way that comes alive in their life. And, you know, we have to be, I mean, as, as practitioners, you know, we have to be very, very mindful and attentive of the difference between what I would call a kind of cheap cognitive understanding um, and, you know, a, a much deeper understanding that, 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 sinks in at a deep level. So we can't allow psychoanalytic therapy, or for that matter, any therapy, to become, uh, you know, a, a, an academic, you know, intellectual experience. We're, we're talking about, we should be talking with our patients, you know, about the most important, personal, emotionally charged things. And we're, we're talking about, you know, ultimately, are people able to live a life that's meaningful and satisfying and ultimately worth living? I mean, the stakes are incredibly, incredibly high. And if we do the work in a way that, you know, that that recognition, you know, kind of um, uh, fades into the background, something has gone something has gone amiss, and it, it it takes a long time to learn to learn to work effectively. So thank you. I appreciate I appreciate the question. Someone else, perhaps. Uh, I, I, there was another question in the chat, a couple more. Um, but I just thought I would add on to what you had to say that in my experience, people sometimes come in consciously saying they wish to make a change in their behavior. And one of the things that you learn in, in, in their analytic treatments, whether it's a psychotherapy or a full-blown analysis, is that they're actually ambivalent about the changes that they say they want to make. So that's one of the reasons, you know, that's very helpful for people to know, to talk about is why they might not want to change, you know, and they might Absolutely. have the reasons not to do that, you know. And uh, I don't know, I, I guess I should tell everyone, the, the chapter or the paper that you read for, for this is actually one of one chapter out of three from a larger document. And that document is, uh, it's available on my website, jonathanshedler.com. So I don't know if it was in, I don't recall if it's in the article that you read for this, or if it was in one of the other chapters. But uh, I make the point, you know, it's not just that some people are ambivalent. I mean, everybody who comes into treatment is ambivalent about change, and uh, you know, we find a certain a certain homeostasis, right, a, a way of being. And however painful or, or you know self defeating it may be, it's known, it's it's comfortable, and you know, it, it, there's a lot of disruption, you know, when, when, when we interrupt that homeostasis. So I would say that every single person who comes to treatment, whether psychoanalytic or any other kind of treatment, uh, you know, it, it is, you know, has um, contradictory motives, is ambivalent about change. Part of them is very invested in maintaining the status quo however painful that that may be for them you know part of them desires change and 
you know, much of the work that we do, if, if we're going to work effectively, we need to be able to address their ambivalence and bring that into the treatment and, and work with it. Because it's not as simple. If people came in and they said, you know, I wanted to make these changes. And, you know, th th this brings us to the fundamental insight of what I consider of, of psychoan psychoanalytic understanding, you know, which is, we are not one mind. We are of many minds. We're of two minds or three minds or many, many minds about everything. And the part of the patient who comes to treatment and asks for change is one part among many parts. And we need to work in a way, I mean, ultimately what we're trying to do is help people to become more whole, which means recognizing, understanding, hearing from all of the different parts and you know, having all of the parts be able to work in, in concert rather than the people working at, people working at cross purposes with themselves. I, um, and we really need to address that in treatment from the get-go. It's with us at every moment of the treatment. Darn point. Uh, I have a question uh, uh, from Simon Matthew. Simon, would you like to unmute yourself and turn on your video? Yes. Hi. I've been following, Hi, you, following you on Twitter for some time, so it's nice to speak to you. Uh, we, we can we can hear you, but not see you. If if you want to turn your your camera on, your choice. Sorry, um, uh, I think I actually. Oh. There you are. Hello. Sorry, I'm in my office. Um, you look like a hardworking physician. <laughs> I'm at I'm at Bellevue in New York City, so a little bit of a different setting. Um, but I, I was curious because I know you've referred to um, to Paul Wachtel and the idea that he has, which I think is related to the previous question about, you know, psychotherapy actually being a form of exposure, you know, in, in as much as it, you know, when done properly exposes people, not just to intellectual understanding of their issues, but, you know, a real kind of emotional connection with what they actually are. Yes. And I think one of the things that I thought was interesting about his work was that I think he does encourage kind of the integration of kind of some directive behavioral techniques. So for instance, you know, some assertiveness, you know, suggestions to, you know, assert oneself and, you know, being more direct in encouraging patients to confront what they're fearing, at, at least once you have a good sense of what that is. And I, I haven't, I have to say that I haven't really found that to be terribly useful, I think because of the ambivalence that Dr. Drescher was talking about and that you're talking about. But I was curious whether you see, you know, a role for some integration there. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do. I, I actually have a lot of respect for, for Paul Wachtel's work. I actually think he's one of the smartest people in the field writing about, you know, writing about treatment challenges. You know, first of all, I think he would say, you know, in the absence of, in the absence of work around the ambivalence and understanding, you know, addressing defense and resistance and working through them, right? And, and you know, in the absence of that work, you know, sort of adding on a behavioral component isn't going to do it, that, that they have to really go in tandem. And, um, you know, and I, I guess, uh, I'd like to give us, you gave me an opportunity to give a slightly better answer to, um, to the previous question. I said, you know, there's, there's intellectual insight and there's emotional insight, but, but actually I didn't say that very well. Insight has to be lived, right? Lived and embodied, right? It's not, right? If it's not, you know, if, if the insight, if the insight is just thought and not lived, it, it, it's really very, it's cheap, right? So I, I think good clinicians are always attending to this, right? When the, um, you know, the maybe the most clear instance you know, where this issue comes to the surface is dealing with patients with an obsessive compulsive personality structure. And, uh, you know, they're often very intelligent, very thoughtful, very logical. And you know they'll often you'll you'll make an observation, a comment about you know something that you understand about them, and um, and the patient will say, "Oh, that makes sense," and it sounds like they're agreeing with us, and the work is moving forward. 
but it actually isn't. And, you know, what we want to say, working, working with a patient like that is, you know, that makes sense isn't really the same thing as saying that fits me. I see it in myself. I feel it. You know, I, I, I recognize it to be true or, you know, or it doesn't fit. I, I don't feel it. Right? We, we really need to be very active in moving from the world of ideas to the world of, you know, to connecting with emotional life and then connecting with, you know, like, like lived experience in the world. They, they all need to go together. So thank, thank you, you for the, the question. Thank you. <clears throat> I have another question. Uh, before I call on that person, I, I did get a request in the chat. Uh, if you are speaking uh, from the audience, uh, not everybody in our audience is a native English speaker. So if you could ask your question slowly and clearly so that everybody in the audience can understand that would be helpful. And again, uh, after I call on you, could you please uh, identify yourself where you're from? Uh, and I have a question from Coleman Durkee. Could Coleman, could you unmute yourself and turn on your video and Hi. ask your question? Hi, Coleman. Um, I think my video is on, oh, there it is. Um, so um, thank you for the, the presentation. I enjoyed the article um, and it's uh, good to hear you speak. Um, so my question is about um, Coleman. Where, where are you? Where are you? Oh, um, I'm in. I'm in New York. I'm in New York. Okay. Yeah. Um, my question is about uh, the movement toward psychotherapy integration. Um, one of the concerns I took from your article was that psychoanalytic ideas are sort of recast as new by other forms of um, psychotherapy. And um, yes, as regularly, right. As uh, what's old is rediscovered and, and rebranded in some um, sort of instrumental psychoanalytic ideas are uh, taken on by other methods. I, I wonder if, what you think about the movement toward integration in psychotherapy, whether it's a sort of worthwhile, um, I think you may mention it in the article, but uh, whether it's a worthwhile kind of movement or? Yeah, I'm of two minds about it. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the world, the world changes, you know, culture changes, and you're, you know, times change. And, I, I, you know, I, I, I think it's really important that we, we have, I think we need to keep creating fresh metaphors that speak, right, all, all of psycho, all of psychoanalytic theory, clinical theory generally, we really can understand, I think, as, as metaphors, fresh metaphors that, that speak to people in, in this time. So on the one hand, the development of new language, new ways of talking about old ideas is constructive. Uh, on the other hand, um, two things happen that, that are troubling. Uh, you know, one is that people are taking very familiar ideas that, that we've understood for generations and generations and presenting them as if they were brand new discoveries, you know, like the specific and unique to their particular theoretical school. And, you know, it, it's intellectually dishonest. It, it fuels a kind of tribalism and misunderstanding where there doesn't need to be, um, you know, so... Uh, I don't know, I'm just trying to think of an example of it. You know, we've got people in the CBT tradition or, you know, ACT is a, you know, ACT is getting a lot of, you know, a lot of airtime in the, the you know, out in public now, you know, and they'll talk about experiential avoidance as if they invented it, you know, as if they were talking about something other than defense and resistance, right? Nothing new here. So, you know, I, I mean, I just find it a little troubling that, um, you know, we don't build on what's come before, you know, we, 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 we just, you know, kick it down and destroy it and then pretend that we've created something new. But, but then there's something else that's more troubling, which is the concept stays, but more than a century of tradition about, you know, 
you know, nuance and depth of understanding about how to work with it disappears. And the work, you know, the concept, the concept is reintroduced, but the work gets more and more impoverished. And, you know, we're losing, you know, the wisdom and clinical understanding that was very hard won. I'll give you an example of that. Um, I mean, David Barlow is a major, uh, you know, major researcher, CBT researcher, a major theoretical contributor, especially around anxiety. And I read a paper of his a few years ago, and, and he's talking about this, this is a unified theory, bringing, you know, bringing everything together and, you know, providing one common language that we can call, all get on board with. And in the paper, he gives examples of working with what he calls experiential avoidance and what we could call defense. And it, you know, he's like, he's, he's giving an actual clinical example. And it becomes very clear to me, this person has spent no time treating patients. I mean, he's an academic researcher. The things that he's advocating do not work. And, and what I mean by that, you know, to be specific is, he says, I'm going to work with avoidance, you know, to help the person pass the avoidance. And then he approaches it very didactically like a professor in the classroom. And in fact, what he's doing is not working with avoidance. He's teaching them about the concept of avoidance, you know, very didactically. And we know, right, we have, we have a century of, you know, hard-won accrued experience that tells us that that doesn't get no, you know, that doesn't get us anywhere. So, it's not just that we have fresh metaphor systems and language, which would be a good thing. Um, it's that it's you know it's that the understanding that goes with it is being lost and and trivialized, and and, and people end up trying to reinvent the wheel from scratch, and and often doing it very badly. You know, <laughs> right? we know teaching people about why they should be different doesn't do it because it doesn't account for the, the motives, the reasons, the investment in maintaining things as they are, right? We know that information alone, knowledge, you know, we'll just teach you about this and then you'll know, you know, then you'll understand it and do it differently. We know it doesn't work like that. You know, how did this just, just core foundational knowledge get lost? So I hope that's an answer. Let, 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 me, let me jump in and say, does it not remind you of, this is sort of not limited to psychoanalysis, that there's a kind of short attention span and an ahistorical factors that, you know, in many modern cultures where, you know, it's the new thing that matters and the things that are, you know, time tested don't matter as much. Yeah, and there's a lot of buzz about the new thing and everybody kind of stampedes to the new thing. And the history of these new things, you know, we, we forget history. And, and so we have to, we end up repeating it. You know, there's tremendous buzz about the latest new thing and it never lives up to the promises, right? It falls out of favor. We don't build on the knowledge and then, you know, the field collectively stampedes off to the next new thing. And, and I think at the heart of this is, is something really, you know, really fundamental which is, you know, life is hard. Life, you know, life presents us with a lot of challenges and we have to be able to, to rise to meet the challenges. It's not easy, right? It takes, you know, real inner resources. It takes sustained effort. Things, a, a lot of things in life, you know, they don't have easy fixes. They don't have quick fixes. There's no magic bullet. And I think, I think a lot of the chasing after, you know, the, the newest fad is, is based on the wish and the fantasy that there's a quick, easy, you know, painless fix for very complex and, and, you know, deeply ingrained difficulties. You know, some of them that are just inherent it's part of the human condition and, and i think it's it, there's a kind of a denial about what it really takes to bring about meaningful psychological change right i mean people are saying well evidence based therapies these work in eight sessions or 12 sessions right as though the brand of the therapy could make change happen quickly and 
it, it's not true. It has nothing to do with the brand. It doesn't matter what kind of brand, you know, what, what interventions you're bringing, that when we're talking about longstanding ingrained experience, ingrained patterns of, of, of being, of functioning, the rate limiting factor isn't your modality of treatment. The rate limiting factor is the rate at which psychological change can take place. Right? right? The old patterns are, are, you know, are embedded and coded in neural networks. And neural networks don't stop existing. They don't get replaced, you know, because there's a lot of good PR, you know, around around the next magic bullet. The rate limiting factor is is us as humans, right? Not the treatment. And, and I think we have a lot of incentive, I mean, culturally, to want to believe otherwise. So I like, <clears throat> we'll go to the next question, but I like to tell patients, <clears throat> excuse me, I like to tell patients, you know, this is a very 19th century invest, invention and 21st century efficiency methods were not uh, uh, part of the consideration in how this process works. So that sometimes can be heard. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we, we have a question from Dee Mueller. Uh, Dee, could you unmute yourself and then uh, turn on your camera? Hello. Thank you. I'm from South Africa. It's hmm. about 7 o'clock or 6.30 at night. Um, yeah. And I, I suppose what I'm really interested in, and I am interested because I have a background in um, physiology. Um, as part of my psychology, degree, as part of my psychology, and what I really have noted in recent times is that the new psych, neuropsychoanalytic approach is very medical and very anatomical, without a lot of focus and a lot of thought about the early emotional world, and 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 your comment about emotion. And I don't know how I'm I'm in that space, how I bring that in, not with my patients. I'm, I I don't. Yeah, don't, with your colleagues, but, right? It, but it's incredibly complex, right? So yeah. one of the tensions in the field, and I think we, I think we ought to embrace and 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 value the tension. It, you know, really goes back to the you know the, the dilemma about mind and brain. You know, mind is not brain. And um, I, 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 you know, I encountered, I, I came across a, an analogy that I thought was wonderful. It was by somebody writing about a concept and they called supervenience. And they used, um, they used the analogy of watching a movie. And, you know, suppose you're watching a, a movie, you know, say Star Wars on your screen. I mean, literally every single thing that you see on that screen, you know, is nothing but an arrangement of, of pixels and, you know, and the, the circuitry that controls them. And you know, the, the point that the, you know, that the, the scholar was making is, you know, we could literally understand everything there is to know about, you know, pixels at the level of the electronics, at the level of, you know, the, the physics of the pixels, uh, that's the circuitry that controls the pixels. We could know, in principle, we could know everything there is to know about that. And we still wouldn't understand the movie. We wouldn't understand the damn thing about Darth Vader, you know, or the, the battle for the galaxy or the relationship between, you know, Darth Vader and, and his son, Luke, right? And the idea is there's simply different levels of discourse. And and the word the word is supervenes. It's a movie supervenes on on pixels. The movie can't exist without the pixels and the circuitry that controls it. But it's not reducible, right? Knowledge of one is not knowledge of the other. And you know, thinking about it as an analogy, because things are much more complicated. But you know, understanding of brain and brain circuitry, and you know, as you know. I mean, people who are doing work in this area literally talk about circuitry is one level of discourse. Mm. Discussion about mind and subjectivity is another level of discourse. Surely there needs to be some kind of interrelation between, between them. You know, knowledge of one might inform knowledge of the other, 
but I think we're making a, a great mistake to think that we can use the same concepts and vocabulary that we use to understand one and apply it to a different level of, of, of discourse. Like so that. for whatever that's worth. It was wonderful. Thank you. Very nice. I, 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 Jonathan, you made me think about a, a movie based on an Isaac Asimov novel called Fantastic Voyage, where a group of uh, people are shrunk to go into somebody's uh, brain to sort of cure him of some uh, physical problem. And one person is very religious. And one of the scientists says to the religious guy, well, we're in his brain, doctor, where is his soul? To which the, <laughs> other person, the, the, to which the other person said, well, we're here in his brain, where is his genius? So that, you know, that, so yes, to be speaking at multiple levels at the same time, is, it can be quite confusing. Yeah, thank, I, I was, thank, yeah. I was very influenced by um, a book by Bruno, Bruno Bettelheim called Freud and Man's Soul. It's very, it's very brief. Um, mm -hmm. But he, he makes the point that this tension has been in psychoanalysis from, from, from the get-go. And actually that the very word psychoanalysis really doesn't translate quite right in English. In, in, in German, it's psychoanalyse. I think, hope I, maybe some German speakers here, I hope I'm pronouncing it right or close to right. But that the that first of all, you know, psycho psyche, to people, you know, in in Freud's milieu, his his readers, would understand the connection, you know, to to the, to the you know origins in in ancient antiquity, it's it's the soul or the spirit, and what he's done is combine two words that really don't fit together, you know, analysis, you know, which is very analytic. And the soul or the spirit, right? The, the the tension is 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 in is in the combination of those words that makes psychoanalysis. And when you translate it into English, you know, first of all, you know, people don't you know necessarily immediately associate to you know to psyche and you know the meanings that it connoted in Freud's day. And you know, so that's one thing that happens. And the second thing that happens is in English, the emphasis goes to the second part of psychoanalysis, you know, with the emphasis on analysis. And, you know, he makes to me, I think, a pretty compelling argument that really shifts the understanding. You know, that that you know it's not mechanistic and you know it's really rooted as much or more in a humanistic tradition than it is in a, you know, kind of positivistic em empirical tradition. And I, I think we lose that. We want to make it sound, you know, very sciencey, but really what we have in psychoanalytic theory is, is metaphors that hopefully, you know, help us to grasp and, you know, work with things that are very difficult, you know, very difficult to wrap our heads around. So the question is about a metaphor is not, is it right or wrong? Is it confirmed or disconfirmed? But is it helpful or unhelpful in, you know, understanding something and being able to work with it because of that? So thank you. Um, we have a question from Emily Frank, who I can see, but could you unmute yourself, Emily? Sure. Yes, um, my name is Emily Frank. I'm in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I'm a psychologist. Uh, thank you for the reminder to speak slowly. That's something I, I, I tend to speak quickly, so feel free to slow me down. Um, I find when I speak to people, including mental health professionals who are not psycho psychoanalytically oriented, they're often very quick to say, you know, how could you want to be part of something so homophobic, classist, you know, the history of racism, sexism, all of that, which is all true. And I have, you know, some answers that I you know, struggle with, but I'd just be interested to hear how you respond to those types of criticisms. And I know those issues are very alive today. I think Jack is far more qualified to speak on that particular topic than I am. Yeah, but this is your, this is your, all right. Um, uh, <laughs> you, you know, all right, I'll, I'll say I'll limit myself to one fairly brief comment, you know, um, Freud wrote thousands and thousands of pages, his ideas were, you know, changing and evolving continually, right, there is no such thing as this, you know, well, this is what, you know, 
this is what psychoanalysis says. Psychoanalysis says a lot, a lot, a lot of different things and, you know, contradicts <laughs> right, psychoanalytic writings and even Freud's writings himself, you know, contradict themselves, you know, repeatedly. And, you know, you could go and cherry pick and make a case for damn near anything that you want to, right? What psychoanalysis thinks about something actually isn't isn't clear at all. That's 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 one thought, and the other is, you know, I think it's really a mistake to. Um, I think it's really a mistake to, you know, to judge psychoanalysis or any scholarly you know tradition today by demanding that it answer for you know and justify what somebody said 50 years ago or 100 years ago you know we don't do this in other sciences and in other scholarly disciplines you know, um nobody says well you know, the theory of evolution, how, how could you believe in that? You know, look, here's this stupid thing that, that Darwin said. Well, you know, let's, let's throw it all out because Darwin, the human being, the person said this. Therefore, the entire, you know, the entire body of knowledge that builds on him should be thrown out also. We just, we don't do that. You know, we don't say, well, astronomy is nonsense because Copernicus got this or that right. And, you know, this is, you know, when I talked about, you know, where are we in the field are our own worst enemy, but we also have enemies out there. You know, this, this, you know, there's no other field that I know of where it's somehow expected that we should be called account, called, you know, you know, called to account for the views of someone writing, you know, a century or more ago. I mean, so I, I, I got I got I got into the, into this recently in Twitter with with some people who are professors who are teaching psychology 101 courses in in universities, and they literally made no distinction between psychoanalysis as a discipline. And Freud, the person, they continually, you know, went back and forth and, you know, equated them. Well, first of all, I believe they actually were ignorant that anything had changed, you know, since the horse and buggy era. So they literally thought that, that people who practice psychoanalytic therapies today in our time are doing exactly what Freud wrote about, you know, really circa 1910, right? Like they didn't even know that, that the field has evolved. There've been sea changes in our thinking and understanding, you know, and they were also ignorant about what Freud actually said and meant. So they got even that wrong. And, you know, what they were really doing was they weren't teaching their students. They were indoctrinating them, you know, in, 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 a, in, in, their, in their prejudices. So yeah, has psychoanalysis done some, we've been around for a long time. You, you know, it, it's pretty cheap and easy for a, a, a treatment modality that was invented yesterday you know, or 10 or 15 years ago, to say, hey, oh, look how we got everything right when it compares itself to a tradition that's been around, you know, since the late, late 1800s. We got a lot of things wrong. But, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's like, you know, that's to me, you know, that's not the issue. I mean, you know, we've, we've, we're going through a lot of We've got, you know, there's sort of a lot of peaks and troughs and wrong turns and mistakes in the history of the profession. What are we building on now? What's there that's of value? What can we be set? What can what can be set aside? You know, let's not reject the entire enterprise based on something that one person said. You know, a century ago or half a century ago. You know, and, and then contradicted, contradicted themselves later. It's an unrealistic standard. I, so I, now I will weigh in. You know, which is <laughs> uh, uh, because I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I mean, uh, you know, there's no, uh, but you know, it, it raises questions like, you know, should should they be playing Wagner in Israel? You know, because of who Wagner was and what his beliefs were. Should we be listening to his music at all? 
Um, and, but, and there are people who have very strong feelings about that. Uh, there is a problem though in psychoanalysis, which is that, uh, you know, in, my, in, in doing my work, you know, to take up issues of what Freud thought and believed in the time that he lived in, you cannot take him out of his historical context. And you need to also understand who he was talking to, which is different than who we're talking to today. But there, but there is the issue where, I, as I went through the psychoanalytic literature, how many papers begin with Freud? You know, so that there's something in, in the culture of psychoanalysis itself, which invites, if you will, this particular kind of criticism, because it's almost as if every person writes a paper hiding behind some idea of Freud. And as we know, Freud, as you said earlier, wrote thousands of pages. And because he wrote thousands of pages, everybody can find a little bit of something to agree with in Freud and hide their own ideas inside them. So that I, I, I agree 100%. There's something in the culture of psychoanalysis, and I would say something rotten in the culture of psychoanalysis, because again, I can't think, right, right, we, we have, you know, we have people who are misrepresent outside, you know, of people in other therapy traditions, misrepresenting what we do and you know very actively and willfully in, in some cases is distorting it and but then there's ways that we're also our own worst enemies and we contribute to it and i think this is one of the ways i mean i mean could you imagine somebody writing a you know contemporary journal article you know in in astrophysics and you know starting the paper with copernicus said you know we internally within the field i mean we we it's it's you know, damn well time that we stopped acting like, you know, functioning as if this is a, you know, a personality cult and started treating it as, you know, a contemporary discipline that, right? So yeah, I agree with, I agree, Jack. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Um, and our, our next question is from Renee Epstein. Renee, could you unmute yourself and turn on your camera if it's not already on? Well, yes, here I am. <laughs> I wrote that I am in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And just to change a little the uh, aspects which are we speaking up to now, I tell you that we have a daily journal in Buenos Aires where every week two full pages are devoted to articles on, based on psychoanalytic ideas. I am a psychoanalyst, I'm an epistemologist also, and I have quite different questions from those who were arise up to now. First, I like this definition of emotional insight in, as the result of working through, which makes a, a contradiction which is the insight and the emotion, which are, again, two different concepts. But what I am uh, interested in, and I don't know if this is the moment to present it, in the need of a, a better definition between psychotherapy, psychodynamic therapy, and psychoanalysis. I am a, a member of the Society of Psychotherapy Research, and I read many of the papers. I received every week of them. But I think that the problem that a long-term psychodynamic therapy is more effective than a short one is not enough to differentiate uh, the time a psychoanalysis takes. I, yeah, okay, thank you. So, you know, this is an issue. This is, we can call this inside baseball <laughs> for those who are not in the psychoanalytic community. You know, there, there's an awful lot about you know, what's the difference between psychoanalysis proper versus psycho, psychoanalytic or psychodynamic psychotherapy? Are they different things? I, I, I'm, I, I am absolutely going to get myself into trouble with some psychoanalyst with what I say now, but um, I, I, I think these distinctions are, are, are just silly and, and, and pointless. You know, there are a range of treatments that are under that are that are informed by psychoanalytic knowledge and and methods and what I would call a psychoanalytic sensibility, a way of thinking about the world, um, you know, depending on the you know the the patient, 
the the time, the frequency, you know, the work can be done in, you know, in, in more depth. We can do small jobs and big jobs. You know, what, what's the job we're setting out to do here? I don't think there is any defensible, just I think we're talking about points in a continuum of, you know, sort of depth and, and intensity and, and engagement in, in the process. But, but I don't, you know, I don't think there is any basis for making a categorical distinction and saying, well, this is psychoanalysis and this is psychoanalytic psychotherapy. And in fact, empirically, you know, you, you, you can't find the difference. You would say, you know, how deep is a particular you know, pair of, you know, patient and therapist or patient and analyst, how deeply are they, you know, are they getting into the, the work of, of understanding? But, you know, it's a continuum. Any criterion that you could look at and say, you know, well, if it's three days a week, it's therapy, but if it's four days a week, it's psychoanalysis. I mean, they couldn't think, you can't think of anything more arbitrary. Well, if you use the couch, you know, if the patient's lying down on the couch, then it's psychoanalysis and they're, they're in a chair, they're not. I mean, psychoanalysis is not an anatomical position, you know, or, or furniture, right? It, it's a very complex process. And um, I think inherent in the, you know, also embedded in your question is there's more supportive therapies, right? It kind of aimed at stabilizing people, shoring, you know, kind of shoring up their functioning. Then there's more interpretive, exploratory, insight oriented therapies. Well, that too is a continuum. And, right, I mean, the most analytic interpretive therapy has supportive elements, supportive therapy has interpretive insight oriented elements you know, that's a continuum too, where a particular pair is on that continuum, you know, changes I mean, session by session, according to the needs of the patient, it changes from patient to patient. So I, I think the whole discussion doesn't, doesn't even serve us. You know, I, I, I would, yeah, I would point out, uh, certainly, uh, <clears throat> many battles have been fought in psychoanalysis about frequency of session, uh, you know, without having any kind of empirical basis for fighting those battles. And, and, and I think what many of my supervisors like to say is that, uh, you know, you can have an analytic process once a week going on and have no analytic process going on four or five times a week. Absolutely. So that it, so, so that it's really more, it, it really that this is an idea that what is analytic should be, is better judged by, um, uh, what goes on in the room rather than, you know, like ne necessarily the frame in and of itself is not necessarily the explanation. And this may make some of the analysts of our younger colleagues angry, but, you know, it's almost like analytic institutes are like bean counters, you know, <laughs> saying that they want people to see people a certain number of times, uh, as if that were the way you're going to learn how to do the process when you learn so much more after you graduate. Thank you, Renee. Um, our next question is from Howard Gorman. Howard, could you um, unmute yourself and turn on your video if it's not already on? Hi, Howard. We can't hear you. You're you're muted. Okay. You can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. It, it's really it, it really uh, prophetic that uh, Dr. Epstein mentioned this question because exact that's exactly the topic that I wanted to ask about and and talk about. Um, I'm sorry, Howard Gorman is my name and I come from Toronto. I'm call, calling from Toronto. Um, uh, my background before um, uh, I became a, a, a psychiatrist and, 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 and do psychoanalysis is I was a mathematician. And so when I got to psychoanalysis and I started to look at psychoanalytic theory, there were a lot of things about it that really struck me wrong because I come from a background where theory is what you do. That's pure mathematics is what you do. You construct theories that somehow hold water in a consistent sort of way. And one of the things I realized about psychoanalysis is that one of the important schismatic effects of psychoanalysis, of, of the way psychoanalytic theory is constructed, is the equation of technique and attitude. That a psychoanalytic attitude is defined in terms of psychoanalytic te techniques. And because every subschool of psychoanalysis validates different techniques, and, psycho and psychoanalytic psychotherapy um, allows for techniques that psychoanalysis doesn't, all this kind of division started to happen. 
I'll, I'll just plug one one thing before I ask my, your opinion about this because that's what I'm interested in. I tried to systematize this and raise it from the level of just as you were discussing it, the opinions of different people who would simply struggle with one another, that I wrote a paper about how to how to resolve that dilemma by changing, by separating attitude from technique. Yeah. Um, you know, and and I, I wrote it in Psychoanalytic Review, uh, volume 95 in October 2008. But the, 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 the problem of that equation is, I think, what what has stymied psychoanalysis from the inside and yeah. made it a kind of a sorry you 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 trying to say something so go ahead well, well I, I agree with you but i would uh, i would look at it a, a little differently so the word psychoanalysis and i mean mean it in the broad sense not not you know a a, a bait, you know the narrow sense is a guild practicing one certain you know very narrowly defined form of treatment. The word psychoanalysis actually refers to three things, and they're not the same thing, right? One is, you know, it's a body of knowledge and a vast literature that has accrued over, you know, generations, right? So it's a body of knowledge. Second is, it's a range of different treatments, plural, you know, that, that are based on that knowledge, that draw on that knowledge. And the third is, it's a certain attitude and sensibility for thinking about and understanding mind and, and behavior that actually has nothing to do with the modality you practice. So, you, you know, you could be a psychiatrist practicing psychopharmacology. You're, you're only writing prescriptions. And... You know, and I can tell you, I mean, it's been more than 10 years. I'm, I'm a psychologist, but I was a faculty member in, in psychiatry departments teaching psychiatry residents. I can tell you that if you think about what's going on, you know, from a psychoanalytic lens, you become a much, much more effective psychopharmacologist. What do you do when the patient doesn't take the medication? Why don't they take it? How do you understand that? What do you do when the patient comes in with, you know, complaints about, how it's affecting the right, 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 there's a sensibility that actually can enhance your work. If you're a pharmacologist, if you're a behavior therapist, if you're a CBT therapist, right? So, so three things, a body of knowledge, a range of therapies, plural, a, a, a certain sensibility and, and, you know, and, and attitude toward the work. And I think we cause a lot of confusion for ourselves when we, you know, when we, blur those distinctions or lose track of the fact that the word means different things. That's the part I agree with. The part that I'm not sure I agree with is, you know, we're going to unify it. You know, we're going to make theories consistent with each other. Theories in psychoanalysis are not like theories in the natural sciences. Like I said before, I think what we actually have is a metaphor systems. So let's go back to, you know, the earliest or the second earliest metaphor system. You know, we can talk about Freud's structural model of id, ego, and superego. So first of all, hardly any analyst even talk or think that way right, anymore. I mean, it's largely disappeared from the discourse. We can talk about other things now. But there's no such thing as an id or an ego or a superego. These are, these are metaphor systems, right? And, you know, if we try to if we try to treat them like as if they were theories like in the physical sciences, they fall apart very quickly. If you understand that we're talking about, about metaphor, right? And then I think we start to think about it very differently. So I think I, your I, question- I, I agree with you. I, I'm not disagreeing with you. I, I, I think I'm getting the fact that I said I came from a science background that sort of pigeonholed me. I'm trying to address the kinds of things you were talking about earlier about three times a week versus one time a week. Hmm. Uh, 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 free floating attention versus it, the, being more active, et cetera, all those kinds of things that have been used to separate different parts of psychoanalysis into mutually incompatible components. And how do we make how do we make all those differences part of a kind of a conceptual approach that, where they can feel they're part of the same enterprise? And I think that's what you're trying to do. I think, well, I also think it's above any individual's pay grade to be able to fix that problem within psychoanalysis. I think it's really, you know, uh, part of the problem of the history 
I highly recommend Paul Stepanski's book, Psychoanalysis at the Margins, which talks about how the, the field has fragmented itself so that it cannot come together and come to shared conclusions about what constitutes uh, a psychoanalytic perspective. Uh, thank you very much. I have one, I want to take one more question before we, we, we close, if I might. Thanks, Howard. Uh, and the next question is from Akash G. Could you unmute yourself and uh, turn on your camera? Hi. Not turned on. Uh, uh, yes. Can you see me now? Yes. yes. Where are Where are you? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm I'm from I'm a psycho practicing psychotherapist from India, and uh, I I just want to start off with. Oops, it, I think... it feels really great to have the chance to listen to Dr. Jonathan on Twitter threads. Uh, that's where I started gaining an immense interest in psychoanalysis and psychodynamic therapy. And my question was actually related to that. I mean, one of the most important things that you address in your paper is the fact that psychoanalysis has been little primitive and closed off in its history. And that shows off mostly, in, it has its very strong effects, mostly in non-Western countries where Say, if I look at my own curriculum or the general curriculum of therapy that is taught in cure, um, psychoanalysis or psychodynamic theory is looked at from a very, still a very, very 19th century or the Freudian period. We haven't progressing beyond that, at least in the curriculum level. So those of us who really gain interest in it, find it really hard to pursue it on the level of training. And so uh, what you said shows off clearly well in non-Western countries where we continue to see it from a very dogmatic lens. We are still stuck in those old ideas in our textbooks. So um, from just wanted to see what your thoughts are on the way forward for, say, expanding the horizons in other countries outside of the US or Europe. Um, your, I think your internet signal wasn't great, so your question was a little broken up. Could you just state the question in one sentence? State the question part again. Yes, the question that I had was, uh, psychoanalysis in terms of training has very, very low outreach in countries outside of America or Europe, but there are therapists who are gaining immense interest in it. So there's a huge gap that lies. We have already seen that psychoanalysis has been very close. Yeah, what, what, what's what's, what's the question? Because your internet the keeps breaking up. The question is, what do you think uh, are some of the ways forward in bridging this gap? I think we, within the psychoanalytic community, really need to. There's something in the culture that has not is not serving us and is not serving is not serving the world anymore. And I, you know, we've been inward facing, and I, I think we need to be outward facing and inclusive and welcoming in ways that we have not been. And you know, that goes back to Jack's opening question about why do, why am I doing the work that I'm doing? I'm, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to help move things in that direction as best I can. And, and, and I would like to think that uh, uh, something like this is one of the ways that we can be doing something because, you know, this is the International Psychoanalytic Association offering um, uh, everybody the opportunity to come in and talk and have a discussion about how psychoanalysts think and for the opportunity for people who are curious about psychoanalysis to speak to senior people like Jonathan and some of the other senior people we're going to be having next year, you know, to talk about the papers that they write and their ideas and see and, and really experience the day to day relevance of psychoanalysis, which those of us who have found it relevant believe in, you know, uh, and I think Jonathan has made the excellent point in his writings is we don't communicate well as psychoanalysts. We might be able to communicate well in our offices with our but we're not good at talking to anybody else. And this is also part of the problem, which I think is my, my open opinion here, which happened in the, in, the, in, you know, in the beginning of psychoanalysis when it became very popular, psychoanalysts waited for people to come to them. You know, the, the, we went through this phase in the middle of the 20th century where you know, it was very competitive to get into psychoanalytic institutes and people had waiting lists of patients waiting to see them. And, uh, and somehow 
when, when that went fell by the wayside, the senior people in our field weren't really very interested anymore in doing what Freud and his early followers would do, which is what they would go to the medical schools and they would drag patients to their Wednesday night meetings and try and, you know, promote themselves, you know. Um, so I, I don't want to use the word branding again, but, you know, in a way, it is a rebranding opportunity right now. Thank you, Akash. Thank you, thank you. So we're just about out of time. Jonathan, you have anything you want to say? Any, anything concluding remarks um, based on that, all the questions that you got today? Yeah, I'll, I'll just add something. It, it's how I start my paper that, that we're discussing today. But, you know, I think if we drop some of the unnecessary and, and off-putting jargon, you know, when we talk about the unconscious and you know, the, the fundamental premise of psychoanalysis, psychoanalytic thinking, is something that I think people intuitively understand and grasp. It, it's, it's the human condition. We don't fully know ourselves. We don't fully know our own hearts and minds. The things that we don't know about, about ourselves can cost us. And there's value in coming to know ourselves more fully and more deeply, not in an you know, academic or intellectual way, you know, but in a lived way. And I think that's the essence, that's, that, that's at the heart of this. And in all of the you know, kind of tribalism within psychoanalysis and the ill will between psychoanalytic approaches and other therapy approaches, you know, I think this basic truth, I think this basic truth you know, too easily gets, gets lost. And, you know, it's actually, if you say it that way, it's actually pretty hard to find people who say, no, that doesn't make sense. I, I don't, I don't agree with that. So I think it, it, it's kind of useful. It's useful to start, you know, with the core shared understanding that, that speaks to people. And, and I'll, I'll leave it there. That's great. Uh, Santina, I think we have a slide that announces uh, the next webinar of the uh, of the IPA. Could we let people know uh, if it, uh, about that? So uh, I don't know the details of this webinar, but it is on June thirtieth. You can go to the website to get further information about that. I wanted to thank Jonathan again for his um, his. Uh, his performance today was great. I, I, it was very helpful to, to hear you speak. And uh, I guess we could give you a round of applause. Thank you all. I'm, I'm, I really appreciate the opportunity to do this and, and the privilege of getting to speak to you all. And thank you, Jack and IPA for making it possible.